happened here? Yeah, one minute, one minute. I've asked Akshit. Yes, what is the effective tax rate? Can you answer? Kanika, can you tell him what is the effective tax rate? Double A? No? Guy? No? Shushan? Yes, sir. What is the effective tax rate? No idea? Jayant? No idea? Jayant is like barely asleep. I mean, <laughs> this looks <laughs> like you. Okay. Yes, Who will answer? Dharam? What is the effective tax rate? <laughs> One minute. You're talking to him or you're talking to me? <laughs> what is the question? Have you understood the question? Yes, sir. What is, huh? <laughs> what is the effective tax rate? Go, Gaba has asked a question. Are you going to be able to answer it? No? Shivani? No? Who else? Chabra? No? Akanksha? Nobody? Yes, Sahil? So, what is this? Uh, speak in English. Yes. Sir, effective tax rate is. Yes. Sir, compounded rate. Sir. In one year, one year. It's an average tax rate. Sir, in one year. No, one minute, one minute. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, we have number of periods in one year. Like, we are compounding every month. But for effective, effective tax rate, we calculate that what will be the actual amount. Wait a second. Average, yeah. sir, no, first tell me, effective tax rate is going to be expressed as what? An absolute number? Or what? A definite integral or a Absolutely. definite uh, de differentiated figure? What is it going to be? How is it going to be? Uh, what is the effective tax rate? Uh, how does it? One minute. What is what is it going to be expressed as? One minute. One minute. Water is measured in how much? Bring me like five liters of water. So water is measured in liters. So effective tax rate is likely to be given what kind of unit? Is it a somebody said percentage, right? So first one minute. Yes, yes. Be quiet, please. Sir, if I am earning one lakh, yes. I am paying tax twenty twenty five thousand. Yeah. So if I divide twenty five thousand by one lakh, that is effective. Yeah. So that is what it is. Okay. So you have to wait one minute. <laughs> one minute. Be, be quiet. Uh, so one minute. So the effective tax rate is the act, the tax liability accrued for a particular period. Yes. Okay. Divided by the taxable income for that period. Yes, sir. That's what it is. Okay. So effective tax rate is normally distinguished uh, with respect to the marginal. No, marginal tax rate, which is the tax rate that you pay on the <coughs> highest levels of your income. Yes, okay. So effective tax rate is likely to be lower or higher than the marginal tax rate. Lower. 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 It will always be always be lower than the marginal tax rate. Sir, speak yes, he, he speak in English. What is the problem? <laughs> and given the mic and speak in English. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sir, like we are compounding every month. Sir, but we have to take out the effective tax rate for a year. Then the effective tax rate will be more than the compounded tax rate for no, normally when we calculate effective tax rate, we are not really uh, fact, trying to factor in time value of money. We normally effective tax rate is always with reference to a particular financial year or an assessment year. Okay, so we normally talk about it as an annual figure because in every country uh, tax is taken on an annual income. Okay, so the effective tax when we discuss effective tax rates, we are talking about an annual figure, total annual tax liability accrued and total uh, annual taxable income for that period okay the reason i say accrued not paid is sometimes because of other kinds of uh, you know concessions and other adjustments you may not pay in that particular year okay so that's what that's what it means okay so is this clear effective tax rate okay all right so dharam will lose some points because he's talking so we have the first uh, one minute one minute we I don't know why you guys are uh, if I hear anybody clapping now then they will also lose points okay where is the um, team is at the end so TJ has also opened his account all right Right, so a uh, few other points. Let me say so here we are not getting this. Um, I'm not able to get the comparison. I, I was telling you, if you remember some time ago, I was telling you about coordinated when we were discussing hedge funds and 
somebody was discussing uh, we were discussing high water marks yes, sir. and you were saying you were talking about where uh, situation is that you won't be earning any money yes, sir. if you have a large uh, drop in the assets mm -hmm. okay in, in your performance if you have a large drop that you won't be earning any money so we just got this news that so if you actually see unfortunately this link is not working for some reason comparison link if you actually superimpose i was talking to you about the coordinated fall in the oil price and the stock market okay if you look at this this is like four hours this is i don't know uh, this is actually one hour so if you take four hours you'll see then i was able to plot this together for some from reason now this link is not working this is the s p 500 proxied by this uh, spy etf so you actually see that there's like the oil price kind of peaks just here and the equity market peaks here and the sharp drop in the oil price is almost perfectly coordinated if you are able to actually get this chart up and somehow this link is working. So there are sometimes you will notice in the markets that there are very coordinated moves in different asset classes. So here you can see equities and oil prices actually almost moving together. But what you have to look out for when you see that kind of correlation is uh, make sure that the if it is your uh, because US being an oil exporter, so sir, there is a uh, loss to US uh, if the oil prices decreases. Okay, it's a good way of trying to figure it out, but I I mean so uh, in that sense it's good, but I will also caution you against trying to get too caught up in these logical explanations because one of the things you'll find is that the market is not really perfect. It doesn't really work in a very logical way. So you should also not have that uh, wrong impression in your head. So that the market will be, function logically yeah yeah but it's good as i said it's a good way to try and explain it because most of the people in the market are trying to explain it but also you should be also aware of the fact that the market doesn't really work in a you should have that awareness also in your head because so that you don't get very caught up in this narrative okay so that what that's what happens but what you have to look out for is uh, you understand correlation there is a directional correlation yes. okay in the sense that when uh, oil prices drop the stock prices also drop Yes, okay, that's the directional correlation, but you also have to look at the magnitude of the correlation. Okay, like maybe that oil prices, so you have to be careful about the, the two different, they're two different things. So maybe that oil prices are dropping much more, whereas equity prices are dropping much less. Okay, so that's another aspect of it. One is the uh, the uh, directional movement, okay, correlation in the directional movement, and the second is the correlation in the magnitude of the movement. Okay, and the third thing you have to be aware of in all these correlations is because you will find when you go into the industry you will find that a lot of people will uh, be very uh, you know they get very caught up in this uh, you know correlation between different asset classes like you have a correlation between VIX gold and, gold and equities and all kinds of things so that people get very caught up in that stuff now what has happened Tushar also will have to have deduct marks Tushar is very active trying to distract Mansi and okay where is Tushar where is Tushar? Okay, Achal. So, Achal, your team is outperforming. Okay. All right. So, um, what was I saying here? Let me go back to that. Okay. So, the, the thing you have to be uh, careful about is that while I just showed you, I mean, I was not able to show you because we can't get, I'm telling you that there was correlation in this movement, okay, in the peaking of the oil price and the stock index and the sharp fall in the oil price, especially after that, okay. So after this period, from this period onwards, there's pretty close correlation in the directional movement. So watch out for the difference in the directional correlation and the magnitude of the price movement, how correlated those magnitudes are. And the third thing to watch out for in all this correlation is that many people will get caught up in, like he was saying, gold and equities and things like that. Okay, all kinds of things uh, people get caught up in. Be very careful because these correlations are not stable. Okay, they're not stable in the sense like you can have stable correlation if there's type, if you assume that, you know, it actually affects, uh, I mean, actually snowfall in Simla affects rainfall in Delhi, okay. That kind of correlation is likely to be much more stable because it's a physical phenomenon, okay. But these market correlations are not very stable. So be careful, keep that also in the back of your mind because people in the market might get carried away by, wow, look at this correlation between gold and equities. So therefore, if we feel that gold is going up, there's something else will happen to equities. So be, be aware of the fact that these correlations are not stable. They can suddenly change, okay. Suddenly the correlation will break. 
so this is basically what makes i mean this is all part of the phenomenon i mean this this is what makes markets very difficult to predict because it's, these are not stable systems there's no real rule like you saw what happened to amazon the other day amazon came out with record profits amazon earnings came out okay all these big companies when they announce earnings you should follow them facebook amazon these are big global companies google these are big global companies so when these companies come out Unilever, you should actually listen to the earnings call, listen to the earnings releases, the discussion of the earnings because you get a very good picture of what's happening around the world. But you notice what happened to Amazon, the stock price actually fell, even though they announced record profits. Okay, the stock price actually fell because the market is saying that the guidance is not positive because the forward guidance is not very encouraging. The market was expecting Amazon to be much more bullish about the future, but the outlook that they gave for the future quarters Mm. That outlook was not possible. Even the profits are record profits, beat expectations. Okay, but so what do you mean by forward guidance? Guidance means when you when a company is announcing earnings, they will also give some kind of guidance about what's likely to happen in the upcoming quarters. Okay, what they're just giving some kind of impression about what they expect. Predictions. Yeah, predictions about what they expect in the upcoming quarters. So that guidance, what the market was expecting, that guidance fell short of market's expectations. But the actual profit numbers are, they've been expectations. Okay, so in spite of that, the stock price falls. Now the problem is, I'm just going to give you some various, uh, I'm going to give you various examples of why markets are so difficult to predict. Now, how are you supposed to know that for this particular quarter's earnings release, the market was going to choose to focus on the forward guidance rather than the actual profit numbers. Because in other quarters, you're going to see that the actual profit number is very good and then the market goes up. The stock price goes up. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So the market, the, um, what I'm trying to show you is that the market is very whimsical. In one particular quarter, the market reaction. Okay, so in one particular quarter, the market may choose to focus on actual profits being uh, higher than expectations. And based on that, they will buy the stock so after the earnings. Yeah. So, and then in some particular quarter, you'll find that they are actually not focusing on the actual earnings, whether they beat expectations, they are focusing on the forward guidance. Mm -hmm. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So, in, in just looking at market reaction to a particular stock, okay, when they release earnings, you'll find that the market focuses on different things at different times. They give different, uh, differing weights to different factors at different times, and there's no way to tell what they're going to do next. Okay, right. so there are same, some. Same happened with the Google. Yeah, uh, could have happened to Google also. also they all, the market were expecting it to be bullish, but it went bearish because uh, the workers of the Google doubted the uh, Sundar Pichai's visions. Okay, I, I haven't followed that story, but yeah, if you said so, basically you don't know what the market. The point is basically you don't know what the market is going to focus on next. Okay, so the market is very whimsical, so you have to be aware of all these problems. So, is there any correlation between divorce of Jeff Bezos and the profits of the company? <laughs> no, no, this is actually not a very un this is not a very frivolous question. There are some people who are asking this question. So, the question uh, is only relevant to the extent that you think that his wife uh, Mackenzie is going to when she gets that sixty billion yes, worth of stock. Yes, now, what is, is she going to be a disruptive shareholder? Is she going to come and start interfering with the operations of the company yes, or is she going to be a passive sh shareholder? She could also be a passive shareholder. So she she might decide that so she, sell all sell the, all the the she could sell all the shares or if she remains, if she sells, of course, that's not a factor. But if, if she says, of course, they will lead to some dilution and control. Okay, so other people might come in or if she just sits on it and she's a passive shareholder, she believes that Jeff Bezos is doing a great job managing the company. Why mess with it? She might just be a passive passive shareholder and just enjoy the dividends. Okay, so it all depends. But it's not a completely frivolous question. People were asking this question, like what's going to happen to the management of the company? Okay, so yeah. So these are the, so the, just the point I want to emphasize is one is that you will sometimes see correlations, moves, uh, and many of the hedge funds might close because there's a coordinated decline in many asset classes. And then sometimes, and then of course, uh, also be aware that correlations are not stable. All right, now one more thing. If you see here, there's a sharp fall in the last part of 2019. You will see that this there's a story actually, which is the Japanese um, investment fund, which is the world's biggest uh, pension fund, GPIF. Have you heard of GPIF? No, sir. Okay, so this is a government pension in investment fund. These are their returns. Okay, the Japanese is the world's largest pension fund. So you can see their negative returns in the last quarter. This is mainly due to the equity down for, uh, drop in equity prices. You see this large drop in equity prices last part of 2019. 
so this also hammered the japanese investment fund because before this they had moved into equities so this is also something that you should be aware of that the world largest world largest pension fund is the japanese investment fund the government pension investment fund okay so they've suffered you can see the reaction in a particular funds uh, returns when the market falls like this you can see a sharp uh, loss in their particular quarterly return for the last quarter of last year no they invested even the japanese stocks fell so there was a coordinated decline in stocks around the world and they have stocks uh, diversified they have some of some amount in uh, us equities also you can see the split here okay you can read this uh, I, i'll put this article in your notes so you can see here this is the split of the japanese investment fund uh, you can see that they're largely operating as a traditional fa fund manager just investing in stocks and bonds but they are now looking to invest a little bit in hedge funds and private equity and other stuff but you can see this they have some foreign bonds and foreign stocks and domestic bonds and domestic stocks okay so just an example okay so uh, let's get on with what we were doing i think there's nothing else okay one more point on your uh, what's going to happen on your uh, project uh, after this class i didn't want to send the mail before this so i will send a mail to some people okay do you guys need more than three accounts per team no yes. three accounts is enough okay so the same rules apply so one account don't do anything in one account practice with the other two accounts so we'll have to reset these accounts all right so i'm going to send emails to uh, three people from every team and uh, you will get a mail from interactive brokers just like early, the mail you received earlier set up a new set of accounts so forget the old accounts but please make sure you keep track of your password okay and then the team leader should aggregate the three passwords and immediately email it to me three ids is everyone clear about this yes. say ayushi will get a mail for, uh, ayushi will get a mail two of the other team members in our group will get a mail essentially it just goes to the people who listed in cp in that serial order first three names in the cp uh, a list okay so three people from ayushi's team three people from uh, achal's team every team three people will get a mail so you set up your accounts okay and then the team leader please don't forget because last time a lot of people did not send me their emails their their ids like your team didn't send okay <coughs> when you set up your ids what happened you're looking like you're not following what i'm saying <laughs> yeah so uh, you will you will get this email from interactive brokers set up the uh, account id the username and the password they'll give you a password please make sure you note down the password carefully because once it's lost it can't be retrieved okay so uh, make sure you note down the password and then once you do that once the three of you have set up those accounts mm -hmm. then the team leader should send me a consolidated email with those three usernames and three passwords like sina what you did last time was you sent me just names saying vai bab sina achal single i don't want names that's what you did last time i don't want names of people i want vai bab 1 2 3 4 or something that's going to be your id and then your password is this clear okay so is everyone clear about the instructions yes, sir. okay so let's do that again and hopefully we can set everything up and we have the live data going and then we can get started with the project practice and then i'll get into the project brief quickly <laughs> Okay so let's try and finish up what we have from before. Okay so we were doing this uh, we were discussing debt capital markets uh, how bonds is, uh, bonds are issued in capital markets and how they're um, priced in this con this di discussion was happening in the context of the government treasury. Okay why is the government why were we discussing the government treasury? Okay surveying the financial sector all these we have covered all of these then we came down to the government treasury i've given you a link to the us treasury web page okay so you can learn a lot from here so again these are all reliable sources the us treasury web page whatever you read here is good stuff okay if you go to the us federal reserve web page so instead of surfing around on the internet and uh, looking at all kinds of dubious sources uh, these are the kinds of sources which are reliable okay so government treasury since the government issues only debt and not equity so we are using this as an opportunity to learn about uh, issuance and debt debt capital markets and how trading occurs in debt capital markets all right okay so dharam please keep a track on how many people are going out okay all right so um, so what's uh, namita tell us uh, what is going to happen how do we if airtel has issued bonds for 5 years at an interest rate of uh, say uh, 12% what are the two components of that corporate bond deal is my question clear say you've been told that airtel has issued bonds okay for 5 years and the bonds have been issued at a ytm of 12% okay 
So, what are the two components of that corporate bond deal? Quiet, please. Components in the sense you have drink, if you are drinking a cup of coffee, the components of that cup of coffee, there's coffee, there's sugar, there's milk. That's how the coffee is made. So, in this case, when you look at that yield of YTM of 12%, it consists of what components or how many components and what are they? Is everyone clear about yes, my question? Yes, sir. yes, Namita, can you help us? Is the question clear? No, 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 that's not my question. No, not clear, Nikita? Not clear? The question is not clear or you don't know the answer? Question not clear. So, if you see a cop, like let me just make it theoretical, just just not giving an example. What are the components of the, uh, what are the components that constitute the corporate bond yield? This is called the all in yield, okay? All in means, um, all in means all in, all, all put together, okay? Uh, all in corporate bond yield, what are the components of the corporate bond yield? What are the comp components that constitute the corporate bond yield? Any idea? Sonam? What are the components of the corporate bond yield? No, why don't you come and sit here? Come to the first bench. Okay, who has, who's going to answer? Who's got the mic? Yes, okay. Tell us what are the components of the corporate bond yield? This is just recap from the last class. One minute. Is the credit rating of the hotel? The credit rating? The credit rating. No, no. Whatever. We, what do we call it? Credit spread. Credit spread. Okay. So it's a credit spread. Okay. And what else? Ah, free rate hotel. Why do? You, why are you continuing to speak in Hindi? Are you trying to make a point? No, no, no. We so we are. This is at a business school. I have nothing, no problem with Hindi, but in a business school we should be speaking in English because many of you don't speak English very well. Yeah. Okay, you guys are coming in, you guys are all absent. Okay. No, if Ashok sir sends a mail, I'll give you guys attendance. But we can show you the mail. No, no, not that kind of mail. I mean a post facto mail. Okay, Sonam, come to the front bench. Now, Saksham can also sit here. Come come here, come to the front bench. Okay, so cop credit spread. One is credit spread. What else? The other is the uh, risk free rate. What is, what is the problem? Why is there so much uh, noise? What is the other What is the other one? Risk free rate. Yeah, so the right way to express this is to say that the components of the corporate bond yield are the credit spread, the corporate credit spread, and the benchmark government bond deal. Okay, so let's call it the benchmark uh, government bond deal. But this is actually the benchmark. Um, I don't want to. Uh, if I write this here, okay. Let me just. All right. So get benchmark government bond deal uh, plus the credit spread. Okay. All right. So any. Um, this can also be the cost of debt for uh, other sovereigns also okay so for instance if you have let's say the kingdom of denmark issuing bonds in us dollars okay so they they will also be uh, priced in the same way so there's going to be if you're going to be pricing and if you're issuing us dollar debt then you are going to be using the us sovereign as the benchmark okay so if you're using yen bonds if you're using uh, issuing debt in yen then the japanese government bonds will be used as benchmarks Okay, so in this case, Kingdom of Denmark. So that, that's why I said cost of debt for corporates or other sovereigns issuing in in. So, for instance, the U.S. dollar is the most popular currency in the global cap, in the debt capital markets. Okay, so uh, most uh, you'll see many international, many sovereigns, uh, non-U.S. sovereigns issuing debt in U.S. dollars, like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Denmark. Okay, uh, you have Venezuelan bonds trading right now, which are actually not trading because they've been affected by. US sanctions okay remember what kind of uh, so you have Venezuelan bonds uh, issued by uh, the Venezuelan oil company okay I think there are some sovereign bonds as well which are now not trading anymore because uh, people are not trading those because the US government has issued sanctions okay on the trading of Venezuelan because they're trying to enforce uh, regime change in Venezuela they're trying to kick out this Maduro guy and bring in this other guy the Guaido uh, Juan Guaido, I think his name is. So they have actually issued a directive 
saying that uh, no US based entity should trade in US government bonds. There's actually a story on that on zero, on zero Edge. When I give you this link, you can follow this website. This is also a very good website to follow. They have a lot of political reporting, but the, in between that, they have a lot of interesting markets reporting as well. Okay, so like you see the story on the Japanese investment fund, the government, uh, the GPIF. Then there's a story on the Venezuelan bonds. Okay, so what kind of risk is this? Remember, we felt we followed. Are you following the story that I'm telling you? Yes, sir. So the, there's this company called PDVSA, which is the uh, petroleum company, the National Petroleum Company of Venezuela. Okay. Uh, so PDVSA has issued some US dollar bonds, okay, and there are some maybe we can actually just look at the story here and um, Maybe that story is still there um, There is actually there was a story on the On the Venezuelan bonds it may still be there Venezuelan Venezuelan bonds Maybe that's gone to the next page Okay, but anyway, so uh, the, what has happened is they've issued. Uh, yeah, this is the one I was talking about. Okay, so trading in Venezuelan bonds has frozen. So this might be the sovereign bonds as well, but there are definitely includes bonds of PDVSA. So what kind of risk is this? Economic, Economic risk. We discovered. We discussed five types of risk. What kind of risk is this? You've forgotten the taxonomy of risks? Legal, risk. Legal, risk. Legal and regulatory. Okay, so this is actually regulatory risk. Okay. But economic circumstances have, has led to this legal risk. No, no, that's a very broad category. That's why I remember when you raised this point when we were discussing the taxonomy of risk. The reason we don't use economic risks is this is a very broad category and that there's not much you can do in terms of managing those kinds of risks those broad risks that's why we talk about market risk credit risk these are narrower categories which are easier to focus you on uh, you know you can focus on those and actually try to manage those okay so this is regulatory risk there's nothing much you can do once the u.s government what has happened is uh, here i think there's some uh, here look at this the u.s ofac this is the office of foreign assets control very powerful remember u.s tra u.s sanctions are very powerful okay so if they, they can actually literally cripple a, com uh, uh, a, comp a country so in fact the u.s has been very restrained the chinese for instance there's a lot of trade war if the u.s issues a uh, uh, basically decides to kick china out of the u.s dollar system the u.s basically can uh, decide to kick any country out of the u.s dollar payment system okay if it does that that country is basically finished okay international trade cannot happen without u.s dollars so all this trade, all this talk you hear about yuan uh, replacing the US dollar, this is all very premature. So effectively, the US actually has been very restrained on China. If they decide they can just kick China out of the global financial, uh, US dollar based financial system and the Chinese economy will just freeze up because no country in the world can survive without US dollar payments. That's what they're trying to do the to the Iranians. Even now, they're still restrained on the Iranians. He hasn't gone, he hasn't gone full tilt on the Iranians as uh, even now sir if there is uh, if us ban uh, china using us dollar so there is a loss to us also because the demand of the us dollar would decline not really yeah. because everybody has demand for us dollar every i mean every country if you look at it these are all myths in our country especially people have a perception that you know there's a elevated perception of uh, chinese economic prowess and the, there's a depressed perception of us economic power if you look at it the world's most liquid capital markets in the U are in the US. Mm -hmm. All the countries with massive trade surpluses like Singapore, South Korea, all these countries, where do they invest their surplus funds? Mm -hmm. Everything goes into US debt cap, US treasuries. There's no other market in the world that comes anywhere, even not even the UK gilt market or the Australian bond market. Nothing comes close in terms of depth of the market, liquidity of the market, the size of the market. Nothing comes close. That is why they wield so much economic power. And actually Trump has not really been using it. I mean, if he really wanted to be nasty, he could really create a lot of problems for these people. He's being very, very restrained, actually. What I notice is that he's being very restrained in terms given the amount of power these guys, they can literally kick a country out of the US dollar payment system. They can just say no US dollar payments with this country. And this country will just freeze up, which is what is happening to Venezuela. Okay. So you see this directive comes though this as well as pointed out correctly. This is an example of regulatory risk. So all these poor guys who were holding Venezuelan bonds. Okay, so this is obviously bonds issued by, okay, they stopped trading in sovereign bonds also. Can you see this? Yes, this is PDVSA, this is their uh, ticker symbol. This you, you should know the names of these companies also. Okay, because Venezuela is the world's, has the world's largest 
proven reserves of crude oil bigger than Saudi okay so uh, and look at the state of this country through economic mismanagement so so they're both sovereign bonds and Pereza bonds have been now frozen. so just imagine you're a guy's investor holding these bonds and suddenly you get this regulatory directive from the OFAC and that's it you can't trade in those bonds anymore so you're just sitting there so now whatever happens value, to the bonds value zero value not zero do you see the plot here you see the plot here value is cents on the dollar normally when we talk about distressed debt we talk about distressed debt as cents on the dollar okay so you can see here it goes down to 20 cents on the dollar in December okay of 2017 it goes down to 20 cents on the dollar now it's back to about 30 35 cents a dollar okay so this is typically how distressed debt trades okay so these countries like these companies like uh, um, uh, oak tree and all what are they going to do okay if they have a division go specializing in sovereign debt okay they will go in and sweep if they feel that venezuelan dot debt actually is going to eventually get repaid okay they will go in and buy at these kind of levels this is what they do this is what distressed debt investing is all about they will wait for a market panic wait for prices to drop to this level if they feel that eventually this debt will pay off because this debt is maturing when 2027 okay so if they, they will take a call on venezuela they will see where, what's going to if they take a view that venezuela will eventually be able to pay these uh, bonds pay off these bonds they'll go in and sweep in and buy it, okay uh, buy these bonds and wait for it to eventually pay out okay this is what distressed debt investing is all about all right so you can uh, survey this article this mag this news source as well you get some interesting stories you can see here in today's uh, it's uh, today's uh, uh, articles as well uh, itself okay so we looked at ratings right now what do we do uh, so we have when we look at a corporate when we look at a corporate bond deal, we know that there are two components, the corporate credit spread and the benchmark government bond yield. Okay. Now, can we decompose the government bond yield further? When we look at the government bond yield component of it. Okay. So corporate bond yield, all in corporate bond deal, we have split up into two parts, corporate credit spread and the uh, government uh, and the benchmark. benchmark government bond yield. Okay. Benchmark sovereign yield. Now, can we uh, focus on the government bond yield? The benchmark yeah, government yeah, and split it into two parts or three parts or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are the two parts? So one today's rating is like one minute, one one by one. Yes, give the mic to Arihant. So one is inflation. What inflation? Be specific. Give him the mic. So you are now decomposing the benchmark government bond yield in any given currency. Okay, what are going to be the two components or three components or whatever? Uh, first is the risk free rate of interest okay the RF that we refer to and the second one is the inflation that the uh, economy will have no no one minute so you are saying that normally when we say uh, when Goel was mentioning the the he was talking about the com components of the corporate <coughs> bond deal he mentioned that uh, the government the risk-free rate mm -hmm. will be one of the components so now so that was taken as the government bond yield so now you're saying that the government bond yield, when it's going to be further decomposed, one of the components will be the risk-free rate. So what is the government bond yield in the first place? Is that not the risk-free rate? Are you are you following why I'm confused? Okay. And your second point was about inflation. So this is are we talking are we talking historical inflation or what? The expected inflation. inflation. Expected expected inflation. So one point is one component is going to be. So now when you're looking at so it's simple question if the u.s government approaches you and uh, you know asks you to uh, invest in their debt securities for 10 years mm -hmm. okay what is the process uh, that you will go through in arriving at your answer suppose the u.s treasury asks you that we want to borrow money from you for 10 years what interest rate do you want us to pay okay so you will give them an answer x percent Mm. So that X percent, how will you arrive at that X percent? That's what we are talking about here. Is the question clear? Yes. Okay. So one of the answers is what Aryanth has given. One of the components is you will factor in what is going to be the expected inflation uh, in the U.S. economy over the next 10 years. Right. So suppose that's say 3 percent. If you assume that inflation is 3 percent. Now, is it sufficient for you to just get 3 percent from the U.S. Treasury? No. no. You want something more. Yeah. So, what is that something more that you want? Today's. Today's? Sir, repo rate. Repo rate? 
Have you heard of the difference between real rates and nominal rates? Yes, sir. You've heard of the Fisher equation yes, and all that? Yes, sir. You've done all that? Yes, sir. In which subject did you do it? In yes, economics? Okay. So, okay. So, uh, the real rate and nominal rate. Okay. So, what is the real rate? Nominal rate less inflation. No one Let me finish. Nominal rate. Your initial track was correct. Nominal rate rate less expected inflation. Right. So the nominal rate. Okay. Let's do this here. So let's do some. Uh, so the real rate. We are all talking about interest rates here. So real rate equals nominal rate minus expected do you agree yes, sir. nominal rate minus expected inflation is this clear yes, everyone agrees yes, okay so if the real rate is nominal rate minus expected inflation then uh, can we write how do we write the nominal rate nominal rate plus expected inflation okay right so we are going to write the nominal rate so instead of using maths we are just writing in english so nominal rate is equal to real rate plus okay is everyone happy <laughs> who is not happy Okay, let's bring this here. Is this clear now? Yes. yes sir. So real rate is equal to nominal rate minus expected inflation. Yes, sir. So the nominal rate is equal to real rate plus expected inflation. Yes. So the government bond yield that you use as a benchmark when you are talking about the corporate bond yield is being uh, composed of the credit spread plus the benchmark government bond yield. Is that a nominal yield or a pro or a uh, real yield? That's a nominal yield. Okay. So therefore that nominal yield now when you are decomposing the nominal uh, government bond yield when you are decomposing the nomin go nominal government bond yield and we have already clarified that uh, Arihan's uh, one of our one part of his answer is correct that one of the components of the nominal government bond yield is the expected inflation. Okay. So therefore what is the other component? Rating. Real rate. Real rate. Real rate. Okay, so are you getting the answer now? Yes, sir. So when the U.S. Treasury approaches you and asks you that I want to borrow, we want to borrow money for you from from you for ten years, what rate do you expect? What what rate would you like us to pay you? What YTM are you expecting as an investor? Okay, so what is the process that you have to go through in arriving at your answer of X percent? What you are going to do? What are you going to do? Tell us the process, Tanuj. Is my question clear? <laughs> because you're not listening so so when the US Treasury approaches you and asks you if we want to borrow money for you for, from you for 10 years uh, tell us what YTM are you expecting okay so when you tell them your when you give them your answer X percent what process do you go through in arriving at that X percent yeah okay so target what you do is you figure out what is the target real rate of return that you expect over the period okay yes, so different investors can have different expect expectations on the target real rate but you would have some idea in your mind that this is the real rate of return i would like to achieve over 10 years if i'm lending to a obviously this is lending to a sovereign because there's not going to be any credit spread component here okay no because you're pricing the government bond. So if we are lending to suppose US government, so yes, there would there would be uh, less credit spread as compared to if we are uh, lending to Bangladesh government. No, that's basically here. What you're saying is, in general, what we assume is that that when you're looking at local currency uh, debt for sovereigns, we don't add the, the credit spread is zero essentially. For local currency debt, so local currency sovereign debt, okay, in a fiat currency regime. Okay, we assume that this uh, risk is zero, although there is a very important exception to this, which is the Russian default. Have you guys heard of the Russian default? 
of uh, 1997 98 no, which led to the uh, us uh, with the asian financial crisis no, i mean it basically was very shortly followed by okay we're going to deduct some marks for nagpal and mittal who are involved in their own little game i don't know what game they're playing but <laughs> where is that uh, so are they in the same team no sir okay so rahul has a few more points and whose team is um, <coughs> sorry where are we am i going in the right direction akanksha okay so akanksha has opened her account okay i'm surprised that ayusha's team is scoring for the first time now in the fourth session <laughs> normally ayush is quite a prolific scorer but uh, he has still not opened his account okay all right um okay uh, what were they talking about so the general assumption is that let's put this here okay that assumption uh, which is uh, that local currency i'm not going to worry about spelling okay sovereign debt um in a you know what a fiat currency regime is no fiat currency regime means uh, you know what a fiat is hmm? yeah so fiat currency fiat is basically a direction a directive okay an order okay here we don't mean fiat as in fiat lamborghini and porsche and that we mean fiat by fiat means an order or a directive okay so fiat currency these rupee notes that we use in india they have no value they only have value because the reserve bank of india says that i owe 10 rupees to the holder of this paper right so this is basically money is being created by the fiat of the government or the central bank okay which is basically a part of the executive branch of the government okay effectively so are you following what is meant by a fiat currency regime yes. what people are still not i think the the response is not convincing so everyone is trying yes. to so, yes. Yes. that's okay but you make an effort you're young you're young you're young people you should have more energy than this okay so who's stopping you from eating eat anything i'm there's no ban on eating in my class there's only a ban on talking you can do anything without disturbing anybody uh, you can eat <laughs> so if anybody has any food please give him some food <laughs> okay guys yes metal what is the problem you are not talking but you are engaged in some activity which is uh, distracting to me so if you eat means you have to eat on your own you should not be uh, there should not be any communication with anybody else okay you should be an island okay <laughs> so fiat currency has everyone understood yes everyone is there half half asleep so fiat currency means this all the most of the modern economies today have fiat currency only in singapore there is some kind of a loose gold standard that works okay but most of the countries us canada india okay uk everything is basically all fiat currency the money is good only because the central bank says that i will pay you 100 rupees okay of the to the bearer of this note okay so that's a fiat currency regime so the reason we say that in a local currency uh, a, a local currency sovereign debt in a fiat currency regime is considered to be risk free is because obviously the government can just easily print that money and pay you back okay so that's not a concern okay so uh, there is obviously a um, in a fiat currency regime and the exception is the russian default exception is the russian default in because russian default was on their ruble bonds in i think this is 1997 or 98 90 i think we can check that but it's 97 98 essentially there was a big russian default ruble is the russian ruble i might have spelled it i, I think is the right spelling yeah ruble is a russian ruble is the currency okay all right so this is local currency so there's a case where the very high profile case where this assumption did not hold the russian government had issued a lot of bonds in rubles okay local currency debt for the russian government the russians could have just printed more rubles and they also had a fiat currency regime the central bank could have just printed more rubles but they chose to default on the debt 
okay so uh, this is uh, an exception to this rule but in general we assume that coming back to your point we assume that sovereign debt local currency sovereign debt is risk free okay all right so um, therefore so so the government bond yield is consists uh, consists of so when you're trying to when you're trying to figure out uh, this uh, rate that you're going to quote to the US government Treasury uh, when they ask you as to what YTM do you expect if we want to borrow money for you from from you for 10 years you will what you will go through in your mind is the first uh, first question is what real rate of return do I expect over 10 years okay suppose that's 4% okay and then you will make a projection about what what do I expect inflation to be over the next 10 years so that was suppose that's 3% so then you will quote a YTM of 7% 4% plus 3% is this clear okay all right okay so uh, so we are doing so so therefore to sum up now if we want to split the corporate bond yield, the all-in corporate bond yield into three parts, what will be the three components? Credit spread. Okay. So I understand that everybody is tired, but you have to be a little bit less sloppy. So you have to say target real rate of return. Okay. What is my target real rate of return? Are you following this? Uh, yeah. Does this make sense? So we are calling it TROR, TROR, target real rate of return. That is something that is a subjective exercise. Okay, it may be different for different uh, uh, investors. Okay, so there is a way to figure out uh, which is to look at the market's um, expectation. I think we should mention this. So this is the these are the three components. Okay, so I've given you guys. Uh, all of you would be well uh, well served in reading this wiki going through this wiki there's a lot to learn from the treasurer's handbook you can learn a lot about corporate treasury risk management there's a big write-up on the credit ratings link itself has a lot big write-up on credit ratings how they work and that's a part of the treasurer's wiki the treasurer's handbook so this I've made optional okay ideally this entire material would have been covered as part of IFM okay because it deals with capital raising a lot of it deals with capital raising risk management but we didn't have the time to cover it okay but you can cover it on your own there's a lot of very good material this is made by the association of corporate treasurers okay so if people are looking for a career in corporate treasury that's one of the career options you have as a finance student okay so this is a very useful book in any case you should read this book it's very good learning okay yes okay i thought somebody was asking a question okay coming back to this points of um, let's see if we can get um, um, let's look at this um, so the question that So if you have this question, very related to the question that obviously current is not properly spelled. Okay, the question that Goel was asking is how do I figure out what real rate of return I should expect? As I said, the answer on an individual investor level, that's a subjective exercise. Okay, you have to figure out what you want for yourself. But there is a way in the developed capital markets to figure out what is the market's expectation of the uh, TROR okay what is the market's expectation of the TROR which is the current market TR uh, we can call it the market TROR okay and the answer lies in the tip sealed tip sealed okay I think in, uh, tip sealed do you know what tip stands for there's too much activity going on this uh, business uh, everybody's one person is coming in and one person is going out although I may there's a waiting list <laughs> okay one minute okay. I'm trying to find out where tips is here but let's just try to do uh, tips okay let's try and look for tips let's look at tips so have you guys heard of tips oh my god this tips is all tips is a very general <laughs> <laughs> okay one minute let's now what causes to this we don't need uh, yeah okay let's look at this a 
where is the trip sealed? Okay, guys, let's look at this. I will give you this link into the let's put this link here. So, this is a relevant discussion as well. We should know what tips is. This is part of our learning on uh, debt capital markets, okay, and to figure out uh, this uh, answer to this question of um, here. All right, so this is too big. Now, you can't read. Can you read at the, uh, on the last bench? No, sir. Chadda, can you read this? You can read? No, I'm asking Chadda. You can read? Yes, sir. Okay. So, anyway, so you can read this on your own also later on. So, let's get an answer to this question, which is a relevant question which Goyal has asked is how do we figure out the, the target real rate of return? Individual investor level, it's subjective. You can always come up with your own figure which where you, dis where you disagree with the market's figure. But there is a way to know what the market is expecting right now on tip on the tror okay so the answer in that lies in the tips the tip stands for t tips is tips it stands for treasury inflation protected securities okay so we have this in india as well but it's not that liquid like everything else in our bond market it's not liquid uh, but the tips originated again in the u.s markets okay so these are tips essentially what happens on these securities is the treasury will adjust the principal to make sure that you get whatever has been the historical inflation over that period so like over the last one year okay when the interest payment comes due let's say okay so if there's been like five percent inflation in the last one year the treasury will adjust the payment in such a way that you will get a real rate of return that five percent inflation will be made up to you so normally see normally what would happen in a in a plain vanilla bond okay if you have bought if you have purchased the bond at par with a ytm of five percent okay that means you get a five percent coupon all right so in that period let's say over the one year you purchase let's say a multi-year bond but or, or it pays annual coupons and it's a one it's a five percent coupon okay so if there is let's say you at the end of the year you receive a five percent coupon on the bond that you're holding okay are you following yes sir. okay but suppose inflation in that year itself was five percent that means your real rate of return is zero yes okay so this is what happens in a normal bond what we call a plain vanilla bond okay or a straight bond okay so but if you bought a tip security if you bought a tips okay because it's already a security because s stands for security so if you bought a tips okay a treasury inflation protected security on that if you got let's say whatever coupon you got let's say you got a three percent coupon okay or you got let's say whatever you got a six percent coupon okay on that essentially it will make sure that even if there has been five percent inflation over that year okay the treasury will make sure that you get a yield of six percent they will make sure that you are made that five percent inflation is made up to you so that inflation is protected so if you have got if you've been assured let's say whatever coupon you've been assured okay six percent coupon you will get a six percent real rate of return are you following Yes. yes, sir. What people are not uh, yes, sir. responding. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, whatever. You, it, it could be anything. Whatever coupon you have initially invested at the beginning of the year, if you got, if you, let's say, if you were, if you were sold a tips with a 3% return, okay, if you were sold a tips with a 3% return and over the year there is a 5% inflation rate, your actual return, your real rate of return would have been negative okay but in this case if it's a tips the treasury will make it up to you to ensure that you realize a three percent real rate of return this is clear yes that's why it's called inflation protected securities okay so now essentially what happens is the tips uh, I, can, I don't know if it's available here but you can see it on the other if you look at the Fred uh, if you look at the Fred uh, database, the Fred database is a very good database. It's a U.S. Uh, it's the St. Louis Fred, uh, the, the St. Louis Fed, which uh, this is the bond yield. Okay, we can actually search ten year. Let's look at this. So the point are you following the discussion here so far why we are discussing all this okay because Goel asked a question when we discussed that there is a 
This is a 10 year treasury inflation index security constant maturity. Let's look at this. Okay. So we were discussing the question of how do you know what the real rate of return is? Okay. One is that you can always form your own view on it. You can be uh, and you can disagree with the market's view. But there is a way to uh, let's just look at one year to make sure that the data is current. What is the data here? Okay, 30th Jan is more or less current. Okay, so now we can look at even five years. All right. Okay. So you can see now the current figure is around. Uh, this is February. Is 0.82. Okay. All right. So essentially, you can see the tip sealed is 0.82. <coughs> okay. This is so you can take this as a how do you interpret the tip sealed? The way to interpret the tip seal so there is a market for tips in the us it's an active market this is what i mean by saying that the us capital markets are the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world which is why every country that has any kind of surplus including our reserves we have about 400 billion dollars of worth of reserves a lot of big chunk of that would be invested in us treasury bills and maybe some treasury notes and stuff like that okay some of it is invested in gold and all that so uh, where do countries invest their reserves they all put it into us uh, i mean a big chunk of it goes into us capital markets because no other market offers that kind of liquidity and depth okay so if you look at so there is a market for tips and the us tips market the current yield is 0.82 okay which means that over 10 year if you look at if you look at the uh, the uh, yields on US Treasury securities okay over 10 years the market as a whole investors as a whole are happy with a 0.82 percent real rate of return over 10 years this is what it means okay so this is the market clearing price essentially if you see I don't know if it will be able to show the max without distorting the end figures is that where we are yeah 0.82 so you can see here that it kind of uh, moves up and down okay so this is essentially this broadly it should be there are some aberrations sometimes because in this 2008 recession it's shot up initially because of some distortions okay the market is still not that uh, as liquid as it should be ideally but in general it is a function of uh, expectations of economic activity okay if you expect if your market expects that economic growth will be quite strong okay then the tip seal will tend to inch up okay because people will want to have uh, because there are many more avenues for lending money and then if they expect that people are going to make higher returns okay so they will generally expect to re receive higher real rates of return no normally we uh, we the way we look, uh, we construct the theory there are some aberrations that you can see here but generally the a rising tip sealed is associated with market perceptions of a more uh, sort of uh, a, a robust economic future which is why you notice here that after this Trump election, the tip seal has been slowly inching up. Okay, it was caught in a range for a long time after the because the U.S. economy has really taken off. Okay, because of the deregulation and tax cuts and all these aspects. Okay, so you can see that the tip seal is slowly inching higher. Okay, so this is basically what the tip seal is. Essentially, another way of and, and what you do is see. Remember that look at this so it will be inverse or directly correlated to the interest rate of the Fed reserve no you can't make a statement like that it's a very strong statement because remember there's another factor in this what is the other factor so what is the tip seal the tip seal is the lhs here are you following the tip seal here is the lhs where my cursor is now here are you following the tip seal is the real rate of return? Yes, sir. The tip seal is the real rate of return? Yes. Okay. So that means if I, that, uh, and can I also observe the nominal rate? Look at this. What does it say? Two, four, 10 year nominal rate. Okay. This, these are actually the tips. Uh, uh, these are actually the tip seals. Okay. Because this is 10 year to 0.82. Okay. So we have to see the actual uh, treasury yield curve um, because this is obviously uh, 10 years is 0.82 means these are actually the tip seals where is the actual yield if we try to select okay We 
should be oh, actually we have another way of getting that which is from the yeah so if you take um, where are we two four sorry this is 218 we have another way of getting that which is okay so 10 year rate is 273 okay so if you essentially want this let's just plug in they're not maybe not be for the exact i think that was for second first feb or something let's just ignore these one or two days differences or let's just take it as 2 point, uh, uh, 273 and 0.82 okay where are we here all right so what is happening is essentially what this means is the real rate is let's say 0 0.82 percent okay and then we have the nominal rate is two point let's make it 2.72 just to be wrong okay are you following this yes, sir. okay so which means now can we figure out the expected inflation yes, so you get a, a few pieces of information from all this market data yes, sir. okay so one is you know the nominal interest rate and you also know from the theory that the nominal interest rate has to consist of the expected inflation because anybody lending money is going to go through this calculation yes, sir. Yes. if i have to lend money to anyone i'm going to first go through this i'm going to first think about what kind of real rate of return do i want to realize over this period okay and then i'm going to ask myself okay how much inflation am i expecting over this period okay so if i'm expecting a four percent real rate of return and i expect three percent inflation i'm going to charge the guy seven percent so that I can realize my 4% real rate of return even after losing 3% on inflation. Is everyone clear? This is the logic. So therefore the nominal rate is equal to real rate plus expected inflation. Okay. Or in other words, the real rate is equal to nominal rate minus expected inflation. Yes, sir. Okay. Or you can also have nominal rate minus real rate is equal to expected inflation. Expected inflation. Okay. So this is the last part that we can write. Okay. No, one minute, guys. What was the contract? Contract with a species of the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> you have not You you have uh, you have also forgotten your uh, contract law. So that is definitely not acceptable. Nominal rate. One minute. So the class started at three thirty, so the class will end at five. Yes, sir. One minute. One minute. One minute. Everybody is half asleep anyway from the beginning of the class. So it makes no difference. One minute. Makes no difference. Okay. All right. Quiet, please. Let's make sure we cover all these concepts. So, are you following this logic? What? So, the nominal rate minus the real rate. What did we find? The nominal rate is 2.72. Okay. The nominal rate is 2.72 then the real rate is 1.90 no 0 0.82 yeah so this is 0 0.82 the real rate are you following the logic here the tip seal is the real rate because the tip seal will be protected okay so if you buy a bond that tips uh, with a two percent coupon the treasury will make sure that you will realize a real return of two percent okay whatever is the inflation will be made up to you okay so therefore uh, the tip seal is the real yield okay and because of these relationships that we know the nominal yield can also be seen as we saw here 2.72 there's another way to see the nominal yield and that is to just go to your chart and type tnx in this particular piece of software tnx is the ticker for the interest rate you can see here it is um why is it two okay so it is actually 2.72 okay this is the index actually how it's constructed so you can see it's 2.72 mm -hmm. 
uh, which is what we have here all right so the nominal 10 year rate is 2.72 the uh, the real rate of the tip seal for 10 years is 0.82 so we can figure out the difference between the two inflation. is what we say is what the market is expecting in terms of inflation over the next 10 year period in the US. Are you following? Yes. Sir. This is an important uh, concept to be aware of that this is what is called the markets expected. In, I mean, this is how you figure out the markets inflation expectations. So when central banks make policy, okay, when central banks are making policy ex uh, decisions, one of the important things they look at is what is the markets inflation expectation and one of the goals of monetary policy in most of these modern economies is uh, is uh, trying to make sure that the uh, inflation expectations of the market are well anchored have you heard this expression yes in policy debates that inflation expectations have to be well anchored so the market therefore the the central bank is always looking at market expectations and uh, markets inflation expectations and trying to ensure that they remain well anchored okay so that covers this point about tips we've covered all these aspects all right okay now let's go on to this um, <coughs> one minute one minute no why are you uh, going back on your uh, promise you said that the cast would be you were one minute one minute no no one minute now we look at credit spreads one sec one sec let's look at credit spreads okay so you have uh, the uh, you have the uh, idea about the you know high grade corporate bonds investment grade corporate bonds and uh, junk bonds remember we discussed the, when we looked at credit ratings high highly rated corporate bonds and lower rated corporate bonds yeah so if you look at so what I've said is there are two important points to be uh, to be aware of so let's go into okay now I think what happened what happened why are two people going okay one minute this now I'll stop going out now if whoever goes out will lose two percent no more going out because you guys are abusing the privilege today you can go but from tomorrow from the next class no more going out there will be like a cat session okay uh, if you can sit through how long is the cat three hours okay so if you can sit through the cat without a break for three hours you, no 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 nothing no going out because you've abused the privilege you can go out but every time you go out you lose two percent your team will lose two percent simple as that because i'm fed up of this attitude you're not concentrating in the class so no more going out you have abused the privilege one sec no no, no. you have abused the privilege no no this is the rule if you don't like it you can go and complain to DE sir because you have abused the privilege that is given to you yes. okay so you have triple a ratings and uh, you have triple a bond ratings and you have lower rank uh, bond ratings if you look at this chart here what we are trying to establish is is two facts okay so let's look at the uh, uh, this is a low grade uh, bond rating okay let's look at let's call it like well, whatever we want to uh, okay let's look at let's say a uh, triple b let's look at it at triple triple b category okay still above uh, junk rating but much lower than the triple a rating okay let's look at um, what we are looking at that this chart two things to be aware of what are we looking at what kind of variable are we looking at here difference in percentage points corporate bond yield minus u.s treasury bond deal so what is the variable that has been plotted here sir, uh, sir uh, spread spread. credit spread yes. okay so this is a chart of credit spreads so one of the things you can see here is that there are two things we want to focus on when we are looking at this chart these have been mentioned over here on top so i'm just gonna uh, so that you can see the chart okay two things to notice here is that obviously common sense which spread is going to be higher the triple B spread or the triple A spread? Sir, triple B. Triple B spread is higher, right? The triple B, the absolute size of the triple B spread has to be more. Yes. Okay, because the net yield on the triple B rate bond has to be more, and the sovereign benchmark is the same. So the triple B. So so one is that I've written it the other way on top. 
I've written that the triple A spread is always lower than the triple B spread yes, or any higher uh, rating spread will be lower than the lower rating yes. spread. That's one. The second thing, do you notice from this chart, uh, do you notice that it's also less volatile? Yes. yes. Can you see that? Yes. Sir. That the movement is much more uh, yes. dramatic in the, in the lower ranked uh, triple B, let's call it the triple B spread. They've just called it low grade, but let's call it triple B. So if you look at a triple B spread, the, the volatility is much more, much higher. Higher. it varies much more, okay, because and so the other thing to note also is that remember we discussed that uh, we discussed the uh, hierarchy of claims yes, sir. when we looked at that balance sheet, yes, sir. okay, so you have like senior, senior debt, debt, senior debt, subordinated, debt, subordinated debt, debt, and then what comes below, what is the lowest rank claim? Equity. Equity. Equity, okay, so now look at one more thing, look at how it makes sense, how it ties in, how the uh, the volatility tri ties in okay one one you see that is is the volatility of the uh, triple b spread is much higher than the volatility of the triple a spread okay and then if you look at uh, the volatility of the stock market okay if you look at the ball of the the volatility of the spread is little uh, hard to get data on that actual data we can compute the volatility from if we have the actual data but if you look at uh, the equity volatility essentially you will find that equity volatility is much higher okay in this period equity volatility was something around 40 percent or so okay this is the VIX have you guys heard of the VIX yes sir okay the VIX is an index of equity volatility this is actually the current level of the VIX this big jump in equity volatility you can see here this is around one month volatility for the S&P 500 okay this is the one month volatility index for options on the uh, uh, S&P 500 uh, uh, this okay sorry this might be actually based on the S&P 100 okay it's a equity index volatility mm -hmm. so this is 90 percent it went to in the uh, 2008 uh, credit <coughs> crisis okay right now it's trading at 15 and a half percent roughly okay so this essentially you'll find the point I'm trying to emphasize is the reason I've given you the link to the equity volatility is that you can think of this when you're thinking about the volatility of credit spreads you see that the uh, the triple B spread is much more volatile than the triple A spread yes. and if you can push yourself uh, further down the hierarchy of claims and think about the equity spread as well because this is just a continuum okay you will find that actually if you calculate the volatility here triple B spread triple A spread and the equity volatility you'll find that equity volatility is even higher than this okay because it is further down on the a hierarchy of claims okay so you have to understand when you're looking at the volatility of credit spreads and the volatility of equities you have to understand that debt and equity is just like a continuum actually okay so therefore the volatility is uh, uh, increasing because depending on how low they are on the hierarchy of claims all right so one last point about this particular topic which is the importance of junk bond markets okay so these terms you have to be aware of high yield so typically when you look at discussions on the Bloomberg or Bloomberg TV, you will find that or if you, even if you look at tickers, you'll find HY as a ticker. So that means high yield, okay, which is junk, junk bonds essentially, all right, which means essentially below this thing, below this, in, this is the non-investment grade category. This is junk, okay. So um, if you look at this, you will see the, and the other uh, ticker you might notice is IG. IG stands for investment grade okay which means essentially again the other side of this the upper half of this investment grade these are all the investment grade ratings okay so if you guys any of you going for the Moody's and if you if you go for Moody's analytics interview normally you don't have to memorize the stuff okay but if you're going for Moody's analytics I think it makes sense to have memorized the Moody's ratings okay so I mean I don't know think I don't think it's really very very important but it, it, it can't hurt okay so uh, uh, in general you just should know where to find this so that you can look up the ratings okay so the point is high yield versus investment grade there is a contrast that we make between these two categories okay so what you have to understand is the importance of junk bond markets if you remember Tanuj was mentioning uh, some uh, several classes ago I think in the previous course he asked this question about how do you sell the securities of poorly rated companies or you said companies which are not like Alibaba which are not so well known how do you sell their securities okay not so well known right how do you sell them sorry low credit ratings okay how do you sell their securities 
higher I higher know, interest rates know. essentially okay so obviously part of the answer is that is the skill of the distribution team that is the skill of the salesman on the distribution team how well you market that product second is that there here you have to understand that essentially the have you guys heard of michael milken you haven't heard of michael milken michael milken is the guy who uh, essentially invented the junk bond market in the us okay so if you if you read this movie barbarians at the gate there may be some references to junk bonds so the entire lbo boom which happened in the us in the 80s okay that was to a great extent financed by the issuance of junk bonds so understand how michael milken made the case for junk bonds and how he built literally built up the uh, developed the market in junk bonds so he had this investment bank called drexel burnham lumber have you heard of them drexel okay so they went bankrupt essentially but at that time uh, eventually these guys were accused of insider trading and all that but drexel what they did was they went and see how a market is developed what michael milken did was he looked at he did some research on junk bonds and he found that essentially what the market does okay kind of what oak tree is doing he found that essentially what the market does is the market oversells okay atanuj will also lose some points because you were So Tanaj will go to minus four. Okay. So what uh, he found was that uh, the market tends to always underprice these uh, security. They tend to oversell these junk bonds. So essentially, what happens is that what he was saying is that he did some research and made the case that if you carefully select a portfolio, if you carefully construct a portfolio of junk bonds, okay. over the long term your default rate is going to be much lower than what the market was expecting right. so the market because the market always panics remember the market is not rational so the market panics and the market this is one of the reasons why value investing sometimes works depending on when you went into the market because the market tends to panic okay so like look at this if you look at this for instance when you go back to the spy okay now if you see here what has happened here if you see the sharp sell off here mm. in the us stock market so there was a lot of panic about trade talks and this that and all kinds of stuff so the market sold off into the year end okay but you see the how sharp this rally is so you could argue that the market has actually at this point the market had panicked and sold off the, the stocks sold off stocks too much the market panicked and now the market has realized so this is how the market works the market moves in uh you know goes through swings of greed and fear okay and panic and euphoria this is how this is why i said markets are not rational okay so uh so the, this this is what happened so what he showed was that if you built up carefully built up a portfolio of junk bonds over the long term the default rate on those uh, bonds would be much less than what the market was expecting so that eventually you will make money on that portfolio so by using this kind of research michael milken was able to sell junk bonds as an investment proposition to fixed income investors to bond investors and that's how remember this what what is michael milken doing he's he's acting as here he is functioning as what distribution or uh, origination distribution distribution he is functioning like a distribution guy because he's going to investors and he's making the case for junk bonds the making the case for buying junk bonds in their portfolio putting junk bonds in their portfolio are you following yes. this is what a distribution guy does Yes, sir. He goes to investors and tries to sell debt securities to them. So this is what he was doing. On the one hand, he was functioning like a distribution guy, going to investors, making the case for junk bonds, and on the other hand, he was encouraging issuers to issue junk bonds. Are you following? Yes, sir. So both sides. This is how he essentially developed the market. For but obviously, the investor side is more important because companies always need money. Issuers always need money. You need to cover the investor side first. Okay. So is this clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so so we can give you a four-minute break. I think. Oh,